Troubleshooting is one of the core skills of a good network engineer. Your ability to troubleshoot quickly is going to help you resolve problems and in some instances can actually save you from getting fired. This is not meant to scare you, but when you have a major outage, your ability to narrow down the root cause as quickly as possible and focus your energy to resolve that is going to be very important in resolving the issue. In this video, we're going to be looking at some of the top 10 tools that network engineers across the world use in being able to resolve network issues in different organizations. Most of you are probably going to shoot me for this one, but I like to look at network engineers the same way I look at pilots. When your flight takes off and everything else is going on well, the value of a captain is probably not felt. But the moment you hit turbulence or you have a bumpy ride, all of a sudden, the relevance of a pilot then becomes more significant. This is similar with network people. When the network is working well, no one really cares or even knows that we exist. But when the network stops working, all of a sudden, we become relevant and people know where we sit in the office. And in such situations where the network has stopped working and you're under pressure, uh, people are calling you from left, right, and center to try and resolve the issues, your ability of being able to narrow down and focus on the root cause to resolve your issue is going to be very important. In English, they say you are as good as your tool set. I mean, a plumber cannot go to do a job without a toolkit. Same thing with network engineers. We do have a set of tools. And without much further ado, so number one is ping. This is basically my go-to tool on, on a daily basis. Whenever I've got a network issue, one of the first things that I do is to use the ping command. So what is ping? Uh, ping is a utility that basically tests connectivity or reachability between your device and a remote device. It sends packets, waits for a reply, and in that it measures packet loss and the latency between the link. And most network engineers use ping to verify if they have connectivity to the remote device in order to establish where exactly the problem might emanate from. So a typical scenario in a corporate environment is someone coming to me and saying the internet is down. I you probably would ping my default gateway, which is my router outside of the office. And if I have connectivity to my default gateway, that basically confirms that my internal network is working fine, meaning my access switches, my core switch, and all the path until I get to the router, everything else is okay. So I would then focus my energy on the one side beyond the router. But if I can't get to my default gateway, then I'll probably focus my efforts on the internal side of the network. So by just pinging that one device, I can get an indication on where I need to focus my troubleshooting on. I am going to walk you through a demonstration on how you can use the ping command to be able to troubleshoot issues that you would experience in your network. If you're on a Windows machine, you can go to start, run, type CMD and press enter. And you should be able to get to the command prompt as you can see at the moment. It is in this command prompt that we type our ping command. So we type ping. Now we can ping the DNS record, which is the human friendly name, or we can ping the IP address. So just to demonstrate, I can ping google.com and press enter. And I'm basically getting a reply from the Google server. So what that basically confirms is between my PC and the remote Google server, there is connectivity. Remember, we say that ping is important for us to test connectivity between our device and some other remote device. So when you get a reply, that confirms that you can connect to the other device. I also mentioned that ping is used for determining packet loss. So if you look at the statistics, you notice that we sent four packets and four were received and zero was lost. So that means that we had 100% uh, return rate, no packets lost. In some instances, if you're having packet losses between your PC and the remote machine, you'll see the percentage. And that itself gives you an indication on which areas you might need to focus on troubleshooting to be able to resolve your issue. I also mentioned something along the lines of latency. 
So the second statistic that we get with the ping command is what is known as the round trip times. So round trip times basically measures the time the packet took to get to the destination and come back. How much was that in milliseconds? And we have an average of 102 milliseconds for the packet to go to the Google server and come back. Now, if you are taking constant measurement of your latency on your corporate network, and you know that your latency averages about 30 milliseconds, and all of a sudden you've got a network issue and your latency is sitting around 100 milliseconds, that then becomes an indication that something is not working correctly. So you can use that to be able to determine the latency on your network. You can also use the ping command, um, ping in the IP address. And I am basically getting a reply coming from that. So you can either use the host name, which is google.com, or you can use the uh, IP address. Coming in at number two is trace route. I usually use this command after uh, pinging my devices as the next troubleshooting step. Trace route once again is just a utility that traces the path that your packet takes from source to destination and gives you information at different steps of that and statistics such as latency at the different points. So you can then use that information to determine if your packet is taking the right path or if you've got any routing issues that you're basically experiencing on your network. A simple example is someone catching a flight from the US coming to Australia and you're passing through London, Singapore before you get to Australia. So London and Singapore are basically your hops on your way to Australia. If your flight gets delayed or there's an issue between London and Singapore, you're going to get stuck in London. So if I were to do a trace, the trace would stop at London and would not go any further. Similar in a network environment. If there's an issue on the network along the path to your destination, your trace tends to stop along the way. And that gives you an indication of the last device that you might want to focus your energy in troubleshooting. Once again, I have a demonstration on using the trace route command. So this is the trace that I did from my home PC going towards google.com. You notice that I come through my default gateway, which is my router at home. And my next hop is my ISP, who is Optus. Then I go through a couple of uh, Optus devices where I get a request timed out. For security reasons, some organizations uh, stop devices from responding to ICMP packets, which are used when you're dealing with ping and trace, trace route. So you probably get information like request timed out. But you notice that on hop number seven, I then exit the Optus network and I go to 74.125. We're probably going to look and cover that IP address in the next, one of the next tools that we're going to look at. I do, I think, two other hops before I get to the Google, um, Google server. So trace route is very important for networking people for two reasons. It tells you the path that you're using uh, so you can verify if you're traveling on the correct path. Your traffic is flowing through the path that you intend to. The second aspect is where your latency is increasing. So you notice that I started with five milliseconds on my home network and I jumped to 84 milliseconds and I go to 106 and 263 on hope number 10. So that 263 might be a bit higher uh, depending on benchmark test that I might have done in the past. If I'm expecting a latency of about 50 milliseconds and I'm jumping to about 150, that could probably signal that there's congestion on my link. So that's one of the ways that you can use trace route to troubleshoot issues that are taking place on your network. IP config is a utility that gives you your IP configuration on a particular device. So some of the information that you might get from this command include the MAC address, the model of your network card, IP address, subnet mask. There's a whole wealth of information that you can get from this particular command, but it's not usually my go-to tool when I'm troubleshooting issues. The reason being that 90% of the times when you use IP config, you're basically verifying the IP configuration on one device. And you're trying to make sure that the IP address configured on the device matches what is your expected subnet. So that's when you basically run this command. So you run it on a device by device basis. But a typical example that I would use it is if a user is getting an IP address that is not in the correct subnet that would expect them, I can then use the documentation range 
and verify the IP address that I'm getting on the actual PC to see if the two are the same. And this is very common when you statically configure IP addresses. There's a very high chance of you making a mistake and configuring it incorrectly. For IP config, um, once again, you type it in the command prompt. So most of these tools run from the command prompt and nearly every operating system has a command line that you can type. So we're gonna look at IP config. You can type it as IP config and you can press enter. You, you're you gonna get a variation of information. I'll just run you through quickly. So I've got my wireless adapter, which I'm connecting to, and I've got my IPv4 address, which is 192.168.0.3. Then I've got the subnet mask, which is 255.255.255.0. And then I've got the default gateway. So I can run it this way, but you tend not to get more information when you run it as that. So one of the uh, common extensions that you type is IP config or when you press enter, you notice that I got more detailed information. Once again, it will give you all the network cards that you have and the different IP addresses that are allocated to that particular network card. But I'm just going to focus on my wireless LAN adapter. So the first thing that I get from it is the model of the uh, uh, wireless card. This is important when you're having driver issues and you want to install drivers. You also get the MAC address, which is critical when you're tracing layer two issues on the switch the MAC address becomes very handy. You get the IPv4 address of your PC, you get the subnet mask, you get the default gateway, and you also get the DNS IP address that you're basically using. And I'm getting my IP address via DHCP. So it tells me that it's DHCP enabled, and it tells me when my list was obtained and when my list expired. Now, what are the scenarios that I would use IP config? One of the key places where this command is very important is when someone manually configures or statically configures an IP address, there's a very high risk of you making a mistake either on the IP address itself or on the subnet mask. So IP config gives you a snapshot of your IP address configuration in order for you to compare it with the expected sub, uh, subnet. So you would use IP config to get that particular snapshot. So there's a whole lot of information that you can get from this particular command. And I would recommend you to just explore this on your device and kind of see what's your MAC address, what's your IP address, what's the subnet mask, lists, and all other things that are basically related. So those are the ways or scenarios that I'll basically use that command to troubleshoot issues on the network. Coming on number four is NS lookup, which is basically name server lookup. This is not going to be a very common command to use if you're not in a corporate environment with an internal DNS. Uh, for those of you that are not aware, DNS is basically domain naming system. This is a server that con translates human readable names such as google.com to the language for the computer, which is the IP address of maybe 4.2.2.2. So when you are dealing with NS lookup, you're basically creating your DNS to try and see if the DNS has a particular record. A typical example is I might be trying to print to a printer using a host name that might be incorrect. So when I do an NS lookup, I then look up the host name to try and see if there's a corresponding IP address on the network. Or if I am not so sure of the host name, but I have the IP address, I can do the reverse lookup, put the IP address and get the host name of the particular device. So I would use that to be able to query. Unless your network issue is a DNS issue, you're likely not going to be using this particular command, but it's always very important for you to know. As I mentioned, Earlier on, this is probably not one of my uh, go-to steps at the very onset of troubleshooting. But if you want to do an NS lookup, this is the syntax of the command. So NS lookup and the record that you want to query. So in this case, we are querying google.com and I'll press enter. So you'll notice that the DNS that I'm using is my gateway at home. The IP address is 192.168.0.1 and it went and queried and it got a response from an unauthoritative DNS uh, with an IP address of 172.217.25.142. If I am suspecting that I've got a DNS issue on my network and my DNS is not working, I can do an NS lookup but put 4.2.2.2, meaning I want to use an external DNS to resolve and test. So I'll press enter and you'll notice that this time around the server that I'm using is level3.net and the IP address is 4.2.2. .2. So I'm using an external DNS server to allow me to query and get uh, a lookup on a particular IP address or a particular host name. This is one of the ways that I would use 
the NSLOOKUP command. You notice that I ran an NSLOOKUP but pointed to a DNS server that doesn't exist and you're getting a DNS request timed out. So if you try this with your local DNS that is supposed to be correct, but you're getting DNS uh, request timed out, then you've got a DNS issue. But when you query with an external DNS, everything else is working fine. So that just confirms or reaffirms that your local DNS is basically giving you issues. So I trust that this is starting to give you a picture on how one can use some of these tools to be able to troubleshoot issues and be able to kind of pinpoint where exactly exactly your issue is so that you can focus your energy in resolving a problem in that particular area. And coming in at number five is the who is, I wouldn't say it's a command, but who is basically queries public IP addresses and determines who owns that public IP address. I would use this mainly when I'm dealing with firewalls. Uh, for example, if I get an IP address on the firewall that's basically being blocked, and I want to find out who that IP address belongs to, I can do uh, who is command uh, on one of the websites and it will return the owner or the registered owner of that particular IP address. This then gives me an indication if it belongs to Microsoft, then it's an IP address that I might want to trust. So I can then whitelist that IP address. But if it belongs to a dodgy site that I cannot probably verify, then I can probably be able to block that particular IP address. So. Yes, when you're dealing with firewalls and you're just trying to verify public IP addresses that you're not so sure who they belong to, the who is command is very important in being able to give you that particular information. As mentioned, who is is probably one of the least used um, tools, not least used. So remember earlier on, uh, we came across a, an IP address when we were doing a trace from my home to the Google server. And we wanted to verify who that IP address basically belongs to. So who is basically allows you to be able to query an IP address and find the owner. So in this case, I put the IP address, I did a lookup and it told me that the IP address belongs to Google. And what's important is it gives me the range of IP addresses. So anything from 74.125 up to 74.125.255.255 or slash 16 is a Google range. So if I'm doubting whether to permit or whitelist this IP address on my firewall, the who is command allows me to, to find out who the owner of the IP address is. So this is a typical example on how you'd use the lookup command to be able to verify who an IP address basically belongs to. So these are the five utilities that we're going to cover in part one of our network troubleshooting utilities. In part two, we're probably going to go through the other five just to make sure that we keep the videos short. But these are the tools that if you are able to master using them, they will go a long way in helping you being able to troubleshoot issues on your network. Remember, it's the amount of time that it takes for you to narrow down what is your root cause so that you can focus your energy on. That is very important. And these tools allow you to be able to do just that. If you know of other tools that I might not have covered, in this particular video uh, that you feel that are important, please let me know in the comments below and I will basically be able to review. Question of the day, what tools do you use to troubleshoot your network issues? What tools do you use to troubleshoot network issues? Please leave a comment in the comments below. I hope you found value in this video. I want to thank you for viewing and I'll see you in the next one.